Okay, this lecture is how to raise IQ, a few suggestions. What happened is I lost some of these slides and images, and I know some of them I've used before in lectures, but now I'm putting them together. This is gonna be a real short lecture, but just a couple key points. I want it all in one spot. Okay, uh, how does a person make them smell smarter? First of all, a lot of people think, and a lot of children think, you're just smarter you're not, or you're only a certain level of smart. And the reality is you can really increase your academic abilities, your intellectual abilities, if you put some effort into it. Um, it's been known even by the original makers of the IQ test. A person can dramatically increase their IQ, their performance on all these standardized tests, and just their daily ability to think. Um, so the first quote is from Voltaire. Why do animals have brains, but plants do not? Because animals move. Our brain's much more for movement than it is for thinking, but being in good physical shape and exercising a lot makes us smarter. This right here is the sea squirt, which in its juvenile phase has a brain. It swims around like a tadpole. Then in its adult phase, it attaches to a rock and its brain is reabsorbed. It becomes a filter feeder. You don't need a brain if you just sit around, you know, like a filter feeder watching TV. Okay, here's a couple good quotes um, to raise your IQ. What is the purpose of a human brain? To walk down a path in a forest or a jungle and to survive. Um, school, you know, gives you pr training and, you know, practice in memorization, but it doesn't train you to memorize. To me, it's actually, you know, ridiculous that schools, all they do is make kids memorize stuff, but they never teach children how to memorize stuff. There's a whole bunch of books. I mean, I don't even know where my copies of them are. Um, probably the best one is Harry Lorraine, Super Memory, Super Student. Learn the memory techniques. Watch a memory contest. See the things that those guys do. One of the things you're going to see them do is you're going to see them put on ear protectors. So you decrease noise distractions. Um, then you, you can't turn your ears off. So by decreasing noise distraction, you increase your cognitive bandwidth available for thinking. Um, developing the ability to think and desire to learn, that comes on your own from your family, from your own personal interest. So it's real important, the role of the parents, to encourage learning and thinking uh, for the child on its own. Not just you know, doing something in school for a grade, externally motivated, but motivated by the person's own curiosity to learn. Um, here's a great quote by Thomas Carlyle. There's always a good reason, and then there's the real reason. You know, a typical dummy just believes whatever you tell them, and um, whereas an intelligent person is more skeptical. They'll look at the reason, they'll say, well, what's the real reason? Because quite often, the good reason is something that's nice, it's polite, it sounds reasonable. But then the real reason something is done is because the person who's doing it wants money or power or sex or some type of secondary gain. Um, so being aware of that makes you a better thinker. Okay, here's a great quote by Ayn Rand. If you think there's a contradiction, then recheck your premises. Contradictions do not exist. Whenever you think you are facing a contradiction, check your premises and you will find that one of them is wrong. So that Ayn Rand lady is an absolute genius. I think she's the smartest woman who ever lived. Just read her quotes and you'll be like, holy crap, her logic is so powerful. And you know, she, she's like from Russia, okay? English wasn't even her first language and she became like one of the best, if not, she was the best female writer of the 1900s. And she's uh, rather incredible, well worth studying that lady. Uh, try to find good metaphors for important concepts. It'll, it'll make you able to remember something much longer. And that's one sign of somebody who's really bright when they got clever metaphors that surprise you and they resonate and they come from two things that seem separate, but then you realize the connection. So here's a quote from Aristotle. Ordinary words convey only what we already know. It is from metaphor that we can best get hold of something new. Okay, that's a great quote. And what's the point of that? That's how we learn stuff. Everything we learn that's new, we remember it by connecting it, associating it with something that's already in our brain. That's how we map cognitive space. You know, we map physical distance, you know, let's say in meters and feet, but we map cognitive space by analogies, by metaphors. Um, if you want to understand, here's a quote from John Boyd, American fighter pilot. This guy was a genius. There's a good book about him. The one by Coram, I think is a good book. So he said, if you want to understand something, take it out to extremes and examine its opposites. I've often found that that helps me to understand something. Somebody tells me something and I say, well, what if the opposite is true? And you'll be amazed how often the opposite of what somebody tells you is actually the truth. And being able to quickly ask that question and routinely asking it makes you smarter. I learned another great trick from John Boyd. This guy was this genius. 
and he would just sit around reading all the time. And then he would get a great idea and he would call his friends on the phone, even if it was two o'clock in the morning. So I don't call people two o'clock in the morning, but if I see something really interesting, like I have some doctor buddies, and if I see something really interesting, I pick up the phone and I call them because I know from experience, they'll help me make sense of whatever I'm thinking. They'll help clarify it. They'll tell me if I'm full of BS. And just a discussion with them, I can often take that knowledge to another level. Plus, having discussed it with them, I will now remember it a lot better because I've had times when I knew something intellectually fascinating and AO, academic organism happened and I'm like, yeah, that was great. And I don't tell anybody. And then a day later, I'm like, I forgot, crap, what was that that happened yesterday? So if I pick up the phone and call one of my doctor buddies said, hey, what do you think of this? Do you realize in diabetes, this happens and this happens and this happens? And he's like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Then having had that conversation, I'll remember it forever. So that's a very valuable trick. So you gotta, it really helps to have at least one person you can have an intellectual conversation with. I realize that most people you can, it's weird, but in American society, the de facto norm is that it's cool to be stupid. Now people don't say, I think it's cool to be stupid, but you could know a hundred people and not a single one of them will have read a book that month. You have to either be watching intellectual videos or having intellectual conversations or taking classes, reading books. You got to do something to keep your mind active or you progressively become dumber. You either keep getting a little more knowledgeable or you keep getting a little dumber. Um, you don't stay in the same spot. Uh, let's see. Then, oh, this is one quote. Psychiatrists are supposed to prevent mental illness by treating chemical imbalances. Instead, they actually cause chemical imbalances and mental illnesses. That's a lot of psychiatric experts have said that. All right, so that's an example of the opposite of what something is supposed to be is what that is. Okay, here's a great trick for thinking better. The concept of five blind men and an elephant. This is an Indian proverb from the, the, the Jain community or Yang community in India. They're like vegetarians and kind of real pacifistic, ascetic and whatnot. Um, and they came up with this metaphor about five or it was six blind men and an elephant. And the point being is the first blind guy is they're just working with an isolated field of view. First blind guy feels the elephant's tail, says it's a rope. Second guy feels the elephant's side, says it's a wall. The other guy touches his ear, says it's a rug. And so each one is looking at a situation from a narrow point of view. And I found that this often happens in discussion of complex topics. Um, and so the smart thing to do is to be able to reserve your judgment. Do not leap to a conclusion. Um, Aristotle had a great quote. The first step to an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. And don't be, don't be overly committed to one point of view, except the fact that you might be wrong. Be willing to listen to the other point of view, because quite often that's how you put together something really, really interesting, a higher level understanding. This comes up all the time, that five blind men and an elephant. It's a very good way to understand things. And then what you really want to do is try to end up being above it all, kind of like a bird's eye view. And this is a great painting, Wanderer Above the Sea Fog by Caspar David Friedrich from 1817. A beautiful painting. And it's the idea of being able to look down and surveil things in a bigger way. There's other metaphors that one can attribute to this painting. It's a beautiful painting, but I like it in the context of Six Blind Men and Elephant is looking from above. He can see all the different points of view and say, well, gee, it's an elephant. And a lot of stuff is figured out that way. Okay, a couple more useful concepts on making yourself smarter is the Hollingsworth problem. So Lita and Harry Hollingsworth, uh, she worked with high IQ students. She in particular was a psychologist who really studied um, really bright kids and what was it like for them in their development. And she came up with a concept called the Hollingsworth communication range, whereby she felt people could only communicate well with persons within about 30 IQ points above or below themselves. She said if somebody was 30 point IQ points, academic intellectual IQ points on whatever the given subject or topic was, because there's different intelligence and knowledge in different topics, you know. Some people are really knowledgeable about one thing but not another thing. So she says whatever the item being talked about, if there's more than a 30 IQ point gap on that particular subject. She says, the person better informed on it seems almost like a weirdo or a nerd to the less informed person. And the less informed person might seem like a dullard uh, to the smarter person. And they wrote a book called Children with IQs Above 180. Well, anyways, where does this all come into play? Whenever, let's say somebody in my family mocks me, say I'm being weird or autistic about some habit or something, I just say to them, I think we have a Hollingsworth problem. <laughs> so, 
And they know what I mean by that. So anyways, for what that's worth. All right, the other thing is the Dunning-Kruger effect. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is where an ignorant person is so ignorant about something that they can't even judge their own incompetence. Um, and it, it's like a typical thing is, you know, most of the fat diabetics I talk to, they all think they know nutrition. You know, if a person's fat, they don't know nutrition, okay? If they've got type 2 diabetes, most likely they don't know nutrition. It's self-evident. But the Dunning-Kruger effect um, ends up having a big effect on people because quite often that's the case. They're so ignorant, they don't even realize they're ignorant. That's like the general American population with regard to nutrition and diet and health. They just think it's normal to be fat, diabetic, and hypertensive and cognitively impaired in their 50s. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about intelligence. And this gets back to the idea of if you want to be smart and become smarter, it helps to understand what does it mean to be intelligent? What does it mean to be smart? And some people say, oh, this is uncool or this is nerdy or this is arrogant. You know, BS. Look, if you want to be rich, you have to talk about money and you have to talk about business. If you want to be smart, you want to understand this. And I was real interested in all this stuff. I, I wanted you know, to get into, let's say, orthopedics initially, and I was afraid I wouldn't get into orthopedics at the hospital I wanted to, so I really wanted to try to figure out how to graduate first in my class, and then I also wanted to become a great doctor, so I felt that I had to become smarter. I was kind of overwhelmed initially with med school, and then also even with residency, how much there was to learn before I sort of figured out how to do it, and by that I mean I said, well, how can I improve this? So I read tons and tons of stuff. Uh, I mean, I read everything I could get my hands on with regard to cognitive development and stuff. Let me see one of my books here. Uh, I mean, I wrote a book just on this subject, How to Raise IQ, Become a Genius. I wrote a whole bunch of things on study skills, all this academic stuff. All right, so anyways, getting back to this, let's just analyze what does it mean to be smart, to be intelligent, because when you do this on your own academic performance or somebody you're trying to help, a student, one of your kids or something, you can often see where the weakness is, where the problem is, and you can fix it. Most of these things are fixable. There's a certain component of genetic inborn intelligence in a person, but there's a tremendous amount that is controllable. Okay, uh, the ability of a person to understand something quickly. I know a lot of doctors that are bright. You know, you talk to them, they get it. Um, the only thing is, a lot of doctors that are real bright and they understand stuff fast, they don't have hardly any curiosity for anything other than get the job done and go home as fast as they can. Um, sometimes that's because they're real busy. Sometimes they have to get home fast for all kinds of reasons. They have to get, you know, take care of their kids or whatever. But all I'm saying is, there's tons of lot really bright doctors, but how come there's so few McDougals, okay? Because they don't have that much intellectual curiosity, all right? Um, and, you know, Schopenhauer used to write, for most men, you know, their, their intelligence is just something to guide them on the path to, you know, make a little money, get a little food, you know, get, uh, get a wife and have a kid or something. They don't, they, don't, they don't have this higher desire to understand the world or any particular subject in detail. Part of that comes from the school system. School system basically has memorization contests and then picks the winner. Says, okay, the top 20% will have these options. The next 20% will have these options. And it's sort of like, you know, a horse race, okay? And not really, you know, training a person to help them improve, to empower them. And schools, you know, basically answering questions on a Scantron test that you've memorized. That's kind of what it mostly is. Okay, so other forms of intelligence. Can the person apply the information? You know, good, sophisticated understanding is creating an accurate model of the world. And then using that adequate model of the world to navigate that domain. Um, a smart person also can take that knowledge and act in their own interest. For example, learning nutrition so you can navigate the grocery store so you can buy stuff to make yourself healthy. Another big thing, this is why young guys have a lot of trouble intellectually in my experience. They're so gung-ho and hyper, you know, I got this hype, high testosterone, uh, uh, I gotta have my opinion my way real fast, that a lot of times a young guy can't understand anything complicated. I've seen that, okay? Um, you got to just chill out. Like Aristotle said, the first step in an intelligent conversation is to control your emotions. Let the other person talk. Listen to their point of view. Even if the other person's crazy or a jerk or you don't like them, whatever, just give them a quick listen. See if they have something to say. Because sometimes you'd be surprised where knowledge comes from. Okay? Uh, get to the point. Um, the best writers, the best speakers, they get right to the point quickly. If a writer or a speaker can't get to the point quickly, the rest of the talk's probably going to suck. Not always, but probably. You know, I always consider it a bad sign when somebody is too conventional. 
you know, if they if they give you like a whole outline of their talk right at the beginning, it's like, why well, don't want to hear that? I won't remember that. You know what I'm talking about? A good speaker, good writer starts surprising you and with something useful, and they get to the point quickly. Those are all signs of somebody who has it together on that subject. You know, a real expert can just jump into a topic pretty much. Um, it's like somebody's giving a medical lecture. They don't have to tell me the whole history of the disease and all the stuff everybody already knows. Get to what's interesting. Okay, handling nuance. Uh, that's another thing too. Um, that ability to control one's emotions and let the different parts of the elephant all be described before you try to put it all together. Um, recognizing contradictions and irony and not, see, you're not, by not committing to any particular point of view, you can hear all the different points of view, notice all the subtly, and see if there's an opportunity to improve your model of the world on that subject, okay? Another sign of intelligence is some people, you know, real clever at making jokes and puns and metaphor, good with language. People who read a lot are funnier. Um, you know, I've noticed, like, you know, back when The Simpsons first came out, The Simpsons cartoon, that was by Matt Groening, and that was very, very funny. They would hire the smartest people they could find to write for those uh, types of shows because it took a lot of cleverness to make all those jokes. Um, ability to recognize patterns and not just look at the superficial aspect of something, but to see the bigger patterns in something, to be in the habit of trying to make sophisticated observations. Um, and that's one of the things I've liked about radiologists. A radiologist has to look at a film, whatever it might be, an MRI of the brain or some other body part, describe all the findings and put it together and summarize a conclusion. So I think that's good real world thinking and then having to summarize it in writing and i used to joke like with students you know a student will often think to learn something is answer a question on a test and i said is that ridiculous you know like if somebody comes to ask me you know what do i think of this brain they show me a bunch of brain mri cat scan pictures i don't tell them can you give me a scantron question on that you know i have to articulate the findings the observations put it together into a conclusion you know to summarize it um, you have to be able to articulate stuff to know something. It's not just answering a Scantron test. I think students get so much better if they get in the habit of having conversations. Like you want to be good at biology? You don't just memorize stuff. Go out in the woods with binoculars and go bird watching. Have a conversation with another person interested in biology all about the ecosystem, all about the different types of animals. And you'll be surprised how much biology sticks in your brain after that. I was lucky I had some friends that were real interested in biology. I learned a ton from going out in the woods with binoculars and studying nature like that. Um, focus your attention. That's another thing, too. Most of the people I've known who are really great at stuff, they're super obsessed with something. And they're kind of narrow in the rest of their life. You can't do everything. You only have so much time. You can't be well-rounded. I think well-rounded is BS. You have to... Pick a few things that you care about and try to be good at them and then do whatever you have to do, but you know, minimize the amount of time doing stuff that's not focused on what you care about. Um, you got to read a lot in your area of interest and then you have to read in all the fields that are related to your area of interest and that ends up being a lot of reading. Um, it's good to be obsessed with a question. Like for a typical weekend, I'll be thinking something like, what causes diabetes? What causes hypertension? What causes dementia? What is the optimal level of protein? What is the difference? You know almost every weekend I got something in my mind that I have to read about and a lot of times my reading about something will make me you know then <clears throat> give a talk or, or somebody asks me a question and that inspires me to study something to try to answer that question so that idea of question answer question answer um, that's normal for somebody who wants to get good at something and it's a big motivator um, another key sign I've noticed are really smartest people they read a lot and I notice that when I talk to people, because I talk to a bunch of doctors all the time, and the smarter the doctor, the more likely they read a lot on their own. To me, that's a sign of a real smart person when they say, hey, I read this book and it said this, what do you think of that? Okay, how many people do I know? I would say one out of 100 people I know actually does that, reads a book and talks to me about it. Um, that's a sign of a real smart person. It doesn't matter what else they do in their life. If they're reading and talking, that's probably a very bright person. Um, for most people, I just see them, they sit around looking at their cell phones all day long and just doing what they have to to get through the day. And they, they're not going to progress much if they're just doing that. Um, let's see. Uh, also a sign of a smart person is they can go beyond conformity and conventional thought. If you're trapped in conventional thought, you can never go above it. You want to be above conventional thought. Conventional thought quite often is some watered down version of events, you know, that will be understandable to a stupid person rather than 
a more precise, accurate model of reality in that field or whatever it is. Um, let's see. Oh, I just mentioned McDougal. Because McDougal, you know, he's obviously a very bright guy. But it's not like his IQ is higher than all these other doctors, all these other internal medicines. No, it's because he recognized the importance of nutrition. He recognized the connection between nutrition and health. So he became obsessed with reading nutrition papers because that enabled him to learn things that would help his patients, okay? And so I laugh about that because I've met all kinds of prestigious people from these fancy institutions. And most of them really don't know that much versus, you know, here's this little Irish leprechaun, I'm Irish too, McDougal, just sitting around reading papers. And that's what he said. He said, all I got to do is read a bunch of nutrition journals and I can become an expert. And it's true. So that's how he did it. And and that's kind of what I mean is it's, it's a lot of times the guy from, you know, who's got the perfect pedigree, you know, Harvard, 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 this and that really doesn't know much and just spouts off conventional nonsense. And then, you know, some guy from nowhere who truly has his heart in the right place and wants to learn, you know, is magnificent. Okay, personality. This is another thing too. People don't realize this. Oh, you're just so smart or you're not so smart. Man, personality is super important, super important. The person has curiosity. They're going to keep on progressing versus a person who's just trying to get by. They're not going to progress very rapidly. Um, a desire to learn. The growth mindset of Carol Dweck, PhD, Stanford uh, psychologist. She's a, she wrote a book about this. It's quite good, actually. The idea that a, a child, a student, recognizes that if they work hard, they can improve. And that's important versus some kids, you know, somebody tells them they're smart when they're young and they kind of cling to that notion and they're afraid that they'll be exposed as being stupid and ignorant. And you have to accept the fact in learning that you're going to be humiliated quite often. You're going to make mistakes. Every time you learn something new, you got to start over as a beginner. You're pro- often going to be humiliated. Start over as a beginner, get humiliated. It's kind of typically see it as you go two steps up, knock back down a step, two steps up, knock back down a step. You just have to accept that. That's part of intellectual development. A baby tries to learn how to walk, it falls down a bunch of times, then it eventually walks, then it runs. Okay. Um, it's good to have somebody inspiring you. You know, maybe you saw somebody on TV or on the internet. Um, a love of learning. Aristotle said that learning and contemplation is the greatest of all pleasures because unlike the other pleasures, it does not wax or wane. And that's true. You can enjoy a good book all day long. You can be fascinated with intellectual question. I was fascinated with diabetes for months, about six months, and read everything I could on it before I you know, came to understand it as well as I wanted to. Um, so that's internal motivation. I actually think that ends up being the most important. External motivation is, you know, approval from family, your parents or whatever. So social approval from your friends, perhaps. Societal approval, it values some particular field. Um, for the parents, the concept of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development is quite good. It's also called scaffolding, you know. The parents show the child how to do something, the child imitates, then the child could do it. He was a Russian psychologist who studied uh, learning development in kids. Uh, Having a good role model. You know, I was lucky my father read all the time. And so he was sort of my role model. So I would read all the time. I wanted to be like my dad. That's good. Your role models for kids should be their parents. The parents love them and want the best for them. Because if the kids don't have their parents at role models, they're going to probably have some Hollywood, you know, knucklehead or other type of celebrity who's not a good role model with a very unrealistic life. And that's not going to help the kid. Uh, And also, just getting back to personality, I noticed that helped me a tremendous amount. Um, Because, for example, when I went to Stanford, I went there to be a wrestler. I had never taken an AP class. I didn't even take honors classes in high school. My parents were foreigners, didn't know America. And so I was very frightened I'm going to flunk out. Uh, But I had loved learning. I was always reading and talking to my dad about books. And so I sort of found that. And I really wanted to do well academically. It's hard to like to make up for being injured in wrestling. Because being injured, man, it sucked. It broke my heart. And um, by that I meant I felt like I'd, I'd failed in life because I kept coming back and getting injured. So I'm like, well, I screwed up my wrestling career, but I'm not going to screw up my academic career. So I had this intense motivation. And so even if somebody was smarter than me, I would be quite willing to study more than them. And I think over time I accumulated learning that way. But it was... It was sort of my personality that made me smarter, not my IQ, because I know, too, I talk to doctors all the time. A lot of them, they'll understand stuff faster than I am. But the difference, I think, between me and them is I'll go home that weekend and read about it for 12 hours uh, versus they might not even care about it at all. And I've noticed that over time, that's how I've learned a lot of stuff is just being interested in it, you know, for months, for years. Um, Let's see. Because I always wanted to grow up and be able to have a conversation with my dad and his friends, his brothers and his other doctor buddies as equals, rather than me just being the kid. Um, 
let's see, good teachers, coaches, mentors, that makes a big difference. If you find a college professor or grad school professor who you admire and you kind of sort of learn from them and imitate them, that could really help you a lot if you're lucky enough to have that. Probably better to choose a good mentor than to choose a famous place. That's another thing I screwed up on. You know, I sort of pissed off. I went to, did my residency at Northwestern because my mom was sick so I could stay in Chicago area, but I had really wanted to go at Harvard. They told me they would take me if I just signed the paper, but I felt like I got to be with my mom when she had cancer. We didn't know she was going to live that long and uh, at the time. So anyways, I always wanted to go there. So I did my fellowship there, but I maybe could have just picked a better mentor for fellowship. Uh, it's a long story, but anyways, you see what I'm saying? Choosing the name of the place versus a specific mentor. I would say in retrospect, you're better off choosing a specific mentor who you personally is going to help you to develop because that'll accelerate things more than just going to a place with a big name. That'd be my advice. Uh, endurance. Energy to study for prolonged amounts of time. You build cognitive endurance. Your brain increases its glycogen storage. It increases its extent of neurogenesis and ability to do all that with practice time. Because any medical student knows that the more time goes by, the more they're capable of studying for longer amounts of time, for going from subject to subject to subject without needing as much break time. Um, your study endurance increases. And then, of course, being healthy, having wide open arteries with a healthy diet, getting adequate sleep, all that stuff improves brain function. Exercise gets the lymphatic flowing. Okay, it causes neurogenesis. All of that is good. Um, we talk about Alfred Adler's inferiority principle in other lectures, but basically intense desire to, like what I had. I was pissed off, felt that I had screwed up as a wrestler coming back repeatedly and getting re-injured, and so that I was going to make up for it by trying to become really good at school. And so that was the Alfred Adler inferiority pr principle, uh, which played a big role in my life. Also, Dabronsky's theory of personality disintegration and reintegration, whereby this is very popular in the gifted student community. They're sad and frustrated about some failure or setback, and they have to take that energy and frustration and channel it into something else positive. So you disintegrate your old uh, area of interest, and you put it into a new thing, and that makes you happier. It just does. And so that's Dabronsky's theory of personality disintegration and reintegration. Um, that's kind of an important concept for being resilient, being able to bounce back from failures and setbacks and disappointments. Real important because everybody's going to have failure, setbacks, and disappointments. So you have to be able to bounce back. Having a sense of mission, you know, yes, whatever, this class or this thing or this relationship, whatever it is, it, it failed, it screwed up, but my destiny is to be a great scientist or whatever it else it is that you're interested in. And that sense of destiny gives you that resilience to bounce back no matter how much you're criticized, no matter how much you're insulted, rejected, humiliated. You say, that is my destiny. I shall consider, continue to pursue it. No matter what happens, I shall progress. No matter what happens, I shall progress. And that's how you become strong, okay? And it's, you know, it's good to have you know religion, whatever else motivates you because the world will kind of beat you down and you have to have it pretty clear in your mind and trust yourself and know what you want to do and that makes you much more uh, capable of achievement. And I can remember I was playing some of these games, you know, like with these cross country guys who had scored higher than me on the SAT test the first time around. And I remember saying to myself, well, why can't I do better on SAT tests? So I took it two more times and my score went way up. And I said, well, why can't I, you know, be a great student in college? And sort of being around people who are successful makes you think, well, gee, I could do it too. Why not me? Why not me? And that that's good because a lot of people are scared. Oh my God, I can't, you know, take calculus. That's too difficult. Or I can't, you know, take this other thing. But if you get around people who are doing it and you kind of see they're not that different from you, it gives you confidence that you could go for it yourself and be successful. So staying healthy, we talk about that all the time. Avoiding distractions. Um, the person from Porlock is a story about Samuel Taylor Coleridge when he wrote uh, Xanadu and Kubla Khan. And how somebody knocked on his door. He was remembering it when he woke up in the morning. And then somebody knocked on the door and distracted him. And he couldn't remember any more of the great poem. One of the greatest poems ever. Uh, so anyways, avoid distractions. So, you know, try not to hang around with people who are dragging you down intellectually. No alcohol, that's for idiots. No MJ for idiots. Tobacco, all that stuff is for idiots. You don't need any stimulants. All that stuff about stimulants is a bunch of crap. I hear about some students taking Ritalin or other things. That's a bunch of crap. I hung out with the guys who were the absolute best students at Stanford. A plus. Myself and a couple of my buddies were A plus students at Stanford. We never did a stimulant. We never did any all nighters. That's all BS. We studied a lot in the day. We had conversations about our intellectual work. And we just knew the material. We could have a conversation about the material. It wasn't a question of, oh, I hope I remember this on test day for my Scantron test. No, it was more like, well, what do you think of this theory? What do you think of this theory? We would talk about stuff. And we would study a lot. But... 
We just knew the material. We didn't hope to know the material. We didn't hope to seem smart. We knew that we were knowledgeable, okay? Because we really wanted to learn it. Um, let's see. And I like the, the Goethe quote. In order for a man to learn a complex topic, he must love it because that's what gets you to, to handle all the nuance and to go through the long grind. You know, when you first start studying a subject, it's a lot of fun. Then you hit this uh, plateau where it's kind of boring and you got to grind through a lot of material. But then when you get to a higher level, it becomes fun and creative again. You know, you start to improvise, no longer just pure rote memorization. Um, all, avoiding all this junk food and stuff, all these things will make you healthier and you'll be able to think better. You'll avoid brain fog. There's a lot of pesticides, herbicides, and other toxic chemicals in processed food that can cause brain fog and impair your cognitive function. And I recommend no caffeine. It can impair your sleeping. It does not make you smarter. It'll make you more alert. It'll make you more able to stay awake, but you don't want that as a habit. That is a bad idea. I never took any caffeine until my surgical internship when I, you know, I was on call every third night and up a lot at night working. And um, I wish I had immediately quit. But, you know, I, I did finally quit coffee years ago, and I'm glad I did. Um, stay away from all these diet soft drinks. Who the heck knows what's the deal with some of these uh, sweeteners? I would stay away from all of them. Filter your water and all that stuff. Okay, a couple more quotes. Um, oh, here's from Alfred Binet, inventor of the IQ test. With practice, training, and method, we can increase our attention, our memory, our judgment, and become more intelligent. Yeah, I mean, a perfect example is SAT tests, ACT tests. They're like an IQ test. And basically, any student who studies for them and retakes them, their score is going to go up a tremendous amount. Uh, I retook, I just studied with a book. I never went to a course on my own at home, and my score went up like... I don't forget, you know, like 200, more than 250 points, I think. I'd have to do the math on it, but it was a lot. Um, but Mr. Fuller, when a National Science Foundation asked the breakthrough scientists what they felt was the most favorable factor in their education, the answer almost uniformly was intimate association with a great, inspiring teacher. And I can say I've seen that a lot, too, with some of the best doctors I've ever met is they had some good mentor who was fantastic in the field, and they just hung out with that mentor, and they picked up, and they learned real fast. So they sort of accelerated their own development and probably went farther than they otherwise would have. Um, develop a personal philosophy that loves learning. We talked about the Goethe quote. Uh, read more books. Find the best books. Listen to more audio books. Watch more educational videos. Um, yeah, like if you're taking a hard class, Watch an educational video on that subject the day before you go to class. You'll be more ready. Develop study habits. It's, it's really unfortunate, but kids go to college and they have lousy study habits. They don't know how to study. There really ought to be a class in every single high school, every junior high, how to study. I'm not kidding you. I know lots of doctors that don't know how to study. I'll tell you one story. I had a friend, this guy who's a high IQ, bright guy, and he flunked his boards five times. I told him, come on, hang around with me for a while. I'll help you to study, and um, you'll do better. I just hung around with this guy. We studied together about three times. I showed him a bunch of my little tricks. He passed his boards right away. I had, I've had i had other students. You know, I had a nursing student who was flunking out of her nursing school. I hung out with her, and we studied a couple times, and she graduated first in her class. So it's been my experience that most people really don't know how to study. And the first thing is, it's mostly just a memorization contest, almost anything you're going to do in college and grad school level. It's not so you get more advanced that you start doing complex, sophisticated thinking and creative, you know, innovations and stuff. So you want to get good at memorization. And there's a lot of ways to do that, you know, with mnemonics, word association, all the memory tricks. And you can learn word association is the main thing I use, but you can learn all that stuff. You know, the memory palace technique and all that, the letter number alphabet and all that stuff. It's worth knowing all that stuff. Um, you want to always be in the habit of saying, have I learned this in such a way that I will remember it? Do a lot of walk and talks. Walk around and talk to yourself. Say all the stuff out loud. Um, uh, sometimes when I really wanted to learn something, I would write a book about it. I would get obsessed with a subject. I'd make all these notes and chapters on it. And then by the time I had studied that subject in great detail, let's say for a couple years, I felt, gosh, I know this. I might as well write a book about it. Okay, here's just a couple pictures. Some of this, some of you might have seen some of these before, but this is what I call the magic bathroom. So, you know, I work a lot. I don't have a whole lot of time. So I try to make sure, you know, I'm always reading something when I go in the bathroom. I usually put a big textbook on a table, a portable table I'll have in front of the loo. And then I'll put a paper back up here. So I'm always reading something. 
this bathroom was decorated at the time when I was taking my neuroradiology uh, boards certification. So I would tape all these neuroradiology pictures to the wall. I would put uh, persons who inspired me uh, on the wall because then I mean, you see their face every day and it reminds you if they did it, you could do it too. And that was uh, helpful to me. Uh, when I was studying languages, I would have language dictionaries next to the loo, etc. So you got to go in there. It's amazing how many times you got to go into that room. So uh, you might as well get something out of it. And I found that I always read at least one complete book every week just from picking up a paperback when I walk into that room. I won't let myself get out of that bathroom unless I've read at least one page. And I also got this idea because Mozart would write letters when he was on the loo and he would say, I think it's only fitting to write while shitting. And I said, well, I think it's only fitting to read while I'm um, in there. Okay. And then I saw the Mighty Monty Python skit and Monty Python had said, I think it'll be my next slide here. Monty Python had said, um, every sperm is sacred. And I said, well, gee, every time I void, maybe that's sacred. And I would always read a paperback book. So here, here's more like my typical bathroom. This is my current bathroom. I'll have a textbook on here reading about um, some more complex subject. Because a lot of times it's hard to motivate yourself to pick up that big intimidating textbook and you want to do some silliness or nonsense or distraction versus, man, you put that textbook right in front of Lou, there's nothing else to do and that'll get you to read it. And you don't get up until you've completed at least those two pages and you go to the next page. Um, and then always read a paperback. This right here is the Foxcatcher book by Mark Schultz, my friend, World and Olympic wrestling champion, my former coach at Stanford. And uh, I'll get through all those books. So somebody will give me a book I'll be done with that book in a couple days or, or a week. I will crank through it. Um, and my whole day, I'm always knocking off a couple pages, always knocking off a couple pages. And I'll go into that bathroom. I counted it one time. And one day I'd gone into that bathroom like 22 or more times. I'm like, and each time I'm knocking off a couple of pages routinely, at least two, you know, probably more than that. Four pages, boom, four pages, 22 times. That's over 80 pages in one day. Um, now, what else? Um, well, these are these little translators when I was studying a language. I used to have an audiobook, C, audiobook uh, CD player that I would put near the bathroom. But, you know, being married with a family and stuff, everybody, you know, sleeps more than I do. I can't play the stuff because of them. I think if I was old, if I could live my life again and I'd be rich, yeah, it's nice having a family, but it'd be like nice to have like almost like a connected house, but not be in the middle of everything all the time because... Give you a little more. I want to listen to my audiobook whenever I feel like it, not just whenever no one's sleeping or whatever. But anyways, you get it. I think that the Magic Bathroom has helped me to learn a ton of stuff, and it doesn't take any more time than I would already use anyways. Um, and this is a typical thing I'll do. I'll come home, I'll, I'll read while walking around in a circle, or I'll just hold the book on my side, and I'll try to say out loud everything in the book and my thoughts about it. So what's happening there is developing the ability to articulate what one has learned, what one remembers, one's thoughts. And I think that that's a valuable thing to do. So anyways, all of those things uh, have really helped me a lot in my intellectual development. And I hope they'll help you. Um, I think they will if you pay attention to them. Um, this is just some things I talked about at Theory Dementia. I've got a whole entire lecture on this, but just getting good oxygen and glucose delivered to the brain, avoiding atherosclerosis, avoiding stimulants. They're all bad for the brain. Every single one of them. Don't take any of that stuff. I never take any of that stuff. And all my smartest friends, they never take any of this stuff. The people who do that stuff are, are screw-ups. Um, avoid all these things that are toxic to the brain. Okay, and that's it. Hope that's helpful.